Okay, um, so believe it or not, this is the last lecture of the entire semester. So now we're on to part two, fine arts media architecture. This is chapter 13, by the way. And we're gonna continue our discussion from the other day. So we talked about columns. That was some of the last stuff we talked about. We talked about Roman arches and Gothic arches. And, and now we're gonna talk about the dome. And in about 100 AD, the Roman architects, they didn't invent the dome. I want to correct that. They made improvements upon the dome because lots of, lots of people all over the world were making domes and they were usually smaller ones. Um, they take a Roman arch, they, they rotate it 360 degrees, but um, in the, but they figured out a way to make domes larger and we're going to get into how did they do that the like so in a rectangular building you, you back then you needed like a ton of columns to support the roof of these buildings and those columns they took up a lot of space and they they made it hard to have very much usable space so the dome is pretty cool because the only columns that are required are around the the edge and a lot of times um they'll be structural but they'll also be decorative so they don't a dome doesn't really need columns to hold up the roof so now you have this big open space that you can um utilize like like there's a lot more room you're you're not having to constantly um walk around or look around columns so um hadrian the, we talked about him when we talked about colonnades i think we talked about him one other time he was the emperor of rome he was spanish but he loved everything greek so um he oh i'm sorry I, I screwed up here actually he didn't first build this but it was rebuilt by him so initially the pantheon which is a temple for all the gods pantheon means all the gods um marcus agrippa commissioned it and then hadrian like rebuilt it and improved upon it so this dome uh, on the pantheon is a largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. We're going to talk about reinforced, reinforced concrete later on, but this is a dome that um, the concrete is not reinforced with rebar. And there's like ever since the seventh century, it's been, it's been a Catholic church. So like the, you just imagine like the roof being made out of concrete concrete's not light it's it's really heavy and so so the romans they they had to figure out like how to make this massive roof and not have it like collapse on its own weight so i'm gonna jump ahead and then i'll come back to the oculus so the solid concrete's too heavy so they the solution is they make these lower walls really really thick then there's a series of concrete rings and these concrete rings instead of it being solid concrete they use these recessed coffer panels these are they they build a mold out of wood which is like sort of like stair steps and then the 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 concrete ends up being hollowed out in the middle it's recessed in the middle so the like the romans use rocks in their um when they make concrete sometimes quite large rocks we'll see later on and what they did here so that it again wouldn't collapse in on itself as they rose up like as they ascended in these rings they use smaller and smaller 
rocks and then at the top they use they just like crunched up pottery and clay and stuff um and then like on the very top of this there's this compression ring and the compression ring presses down and holds all the other rings uh, in place so you see right here this circle right here what is what is that circle well let me tell you what it is it's the it's a ocul it's called an oculus or an eye now part of the reason why they put this circle in there is because if this compression ring was solid again it would be too heavy so um they have the circle cut out of it not exactly cut out of it but like molded out of it um, because then that makes it less heavy but the other great thing about this circle is that you know they didn't have electricity back then so it it lets in the heavenly light of the gods from the sky it releases heat as the heat rises it acts as a clock or a sundial like as the as the sun moves in the sky the light moves around the coffers and then it lets in rain and that you could think like well that's a terrible idea but there was like a drain in the bottom of the floor so that rain drained out but it still kind of acted as a, like a cooling force plus that would be kind of cool to be in there and see it raining as long as it didn't flood so there's there's rooms all at rooms <laughs> there's domes all over the world and i'm going to put a video in this week's folder about the dome of the rock but the dome of the rock is a sacred place in jerusalem it's sacred to muslims jews and christians and it was a sacred place to the ancient romans as well so the there's a there's a big rock in the middle of this dome and uh, in the middle of this building and this building was built by caliph abin al-malak ibn marwan in the late seventh century he's one of the first generation of muslims um he like it's debated why they built this but um but i'm gonna go with the common reason for building it Okay, so it was a it's a Roman temple in the past before this was built. It was dedicated to Jupiter. It's also believed to be the site of Solomon's temple and King Herod's temple. And this is supposed to be the place where Abraham um, attempts to sacrifice his son Isaac. But the reason why the caliph is believed to have built it is because that rock is the rock where the prophet muhammad ascended into heaven and it was not intended originally as a mosque but now now it's um it's used as a mosque it's, it's used as all sorts of things and by the way in the book i i made a mistake i said it was a pentagram but it's actually an octagonal below the dome so we in Houston we have all sorts of domes. There's the Astra Dome. Who knows what they're going to end up doing with it? Um, the, the, it's been ever since it quit being a a stadium. There like been like co multiple commissions made trying to figure out what they're going to do with that space. We have a dome at. We've talked about the historic Harris County Courthouse before. There's a dome there. If you print out and take your assignment with you when we do the scavenger hunt when you do the scavenger hunt you're gonna have to wear a mask i'm sure but you can ask them if you could go into the building because there's also stained glass in the dome so you can get several of the items on the scavenger hunt just from that one building the magnolia ballroom on franklin has a dome however i think it's closed and from the outside you can't really see the dome because it's a kind of a flat dome um so from there we're going to go to the gothic arch i said we talked about it before but we we didn't i made a mistake so we did talk about the gothic arch before when we were talking about light and color 
So as we said before, the Gothic arch was introduced by Abbot Suguer in 1140. We talked about this before. It has advantages over Roman arches in that it can rise higher. You can use more slender columns. And because it can rise higher, it lets in more light. And because you have more slender columns, you use less material. And also it's causing less thrust and stress on the surrounding areas because it, the thrust goes curves down through here instead of going like straight down. Um, so when they started using Gothic arches, they started more frequently using stained glass. Like in ancient Rome, stained glass was used in residences. Um, but during this Gothic period, they start using it more and more frequently in cathedrals and churches. It, um, a lot of times, so this is the outer Gothic arch, but a lot of times these, these Gothic arches that are used for windows will have smaller Gothic arches. And they, they call this, they call this tracery. And it's kind of like reminiscent of plant forms. So within those, they'll insert the stained glass. Like we can look at this window here and it's, it's got like a million of these little arches in it. Although they're not strictly arch shapes because of the, the little details on the top. So glass was discovered in the sixth century BC in Mesopotamia. There's all sorts of stories about how it was discovered um, like one story was a bunch of Phoenicians were out on the beach cooking and the, the, the sand had a lot of salt in it, which is an alkali. And then they believed that like it melted the sand and then when it cooled, it was glass. But then I read that, um, you'd have to have a really hot fire for that sand to melt. It couldn't be just like a cooking fire. But like the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Romans, they, they all made colored glass beads and objects. The glass back during this time was not clear. It was kind of like foggy. You couldn't see through it. It was opaque. The Egyptians had glass factories. And then, like I said a little while ago, that in the first century AD, the, the, the Romans used stained glass in their homes. But like, you know, that stained glass in Roman homes, it, it's all crumbled since then. So the oldest known surviving stained glass is in Germany in the Augsburg Cathedral. It's the, the, the prophet Daniel. And um, with the, once they started using these Gothic arches, and then they started more frequently using stained glass in churches. Like this is actually before the Gothic arch, slightly before. So stained glass, like the reason it's called stained glass is because on the outside of the window uh, facing the street, they when before they fire the glass, um, they put the silver stain to the outside of the window and because they have to heat the glass up so high that stain turns yellow. Um, and then the interior side of the glass is painted. Now what people do rather than paint it, they use different colored glass. But back then they used to, to paint it and, um, and stained glass in and of itself is considered a form of painting. But like, to make stained glass back then was unbelievably expensive and, and it took a lot of time um, to make the glass and paint the glass. So people, even the rich people didn't start using it in their homes again until the 1400s. So we kind of talked about this before the schism between the Catholic and the, and the Protestant church. And um, during the, the Reformation, when all these like 
new Protestant sects were forming and the Protestants did not believe in icons or at least the the the, the really evangelical ones didn't they because they thought only God could make a figure and and they thought people were worshiping the saints and not Jesus and God so they they went into the churches and not only did they destroy all the sculptures and stuff they also broke up a lot of stained glass so during that period in order to save their stained glass a lot of catholic churches would hide it and they would hide their like their icons and stuff so that it wouldn't get destroyed so some of it has survived because it was hidden um, but a lot of it was broken up so um Saint glass wasn't just used in the like the christian world it was it was also um frequently used in the islamic world and um this is man i would like to go see this this is one of the supposed to be one of the most premier examples of a residence or a place that was you it's now a museum a place that was used as a resident that not only has amazing mosaics but also has beautiful stained glass throughout and this is the it was originally called the imperial new palace and then um it started being called later on in the 19th century the the top cappy palace which means cannon gate and it was originally commissioned by Mehmet the Conqueror, like uh, this is after the um, they he was a sultan. This is after Istanbul was captured and taken from the from the Christians, and um, and then it became occupied by um, like like worshippers of well, I'm saying it wrong. Sorry, practitioners of Islam. And when Mehmet built this place, he um, he wanted it to be like his residence, but he also wanted to like show what a great leader he was and how powerful he was. So he brought in um, stonemasons and carpenters and craftsmen from all over the the Europe and the Middle East and Africa, and he brought them in to construct it. And it was the, for many years, it was the main residence of the Ottoman sultans. So we, we have lots of examples of stained glass in Houston, like churches. There's the Church Christ Cathedral um, in downtown, uh, the Cathedral of the S Sacred Heart. The his, this, is the, this is inside the dome at the historic Harris County Courthouse. This is Christ Church Cathedral. This is Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, where this one's found. Um, so from, so, okay, so up until this point in time, 1796, people were using masonry and stone to make their buildings and concrete. No, not even concrete, because people lost the, people forgot how to make it. Um, so in 1796, this is the first time that iron is used in a building. And um, it was used in the Diddleton Flax Factory. I couldn't even say that. I started slurring my words there in England. And iron would place wood as these structural supports because it was somewhat less flammable than wood. So iron, they make it, they heat iron ore, coke, center, whatever that is, and limestone. And, and it, it's in comparison to wood, it's relatively lightweight. It's strong, like it can be compressed, like you can have heavy loads on top of it. So it's strong in compression. You can get taller and slimmer buildings. And it's, you can, it's cheap and it can be mass produced. So cast iron is when they make a mold and then they they 
liquefy the iron at high temperatures and pour it into the mold and then you can cast it and then you can recast it and recast it multiple times and um and then there's wrought iron which is where the shape of the iron is heated or the iron is heated and then the shape is manipulated with tools while it's still hot so the most famous wrought iron building and by that again all these pieces were made by hand is the eiffel tower it's built in 1889 by gustav eiffel and his company and it's got 80,000 pieces of wrought iron and it weighs 10,000 tons i've actually seen it i didn't go up into it um i think i lost my contact when i was looking up at it that's back when i wore contacts so the eiffel tower remember we talked about maya lynn and how she entered this jury competition for the vietnam war memorial well gustav eiffel and his company they entered a competition and the competition was to build a monument for the 1889 world's fair but it also was a hundred year anniversary of the french revolution so lots of people entered designs and one of my favorite designs was a giant guillotine the guillotine was during the uh, french revolution and the reign of terror like people would get their head chopped off by a guillotine so somebody like this was someone's design to commemorate it and then i guess the judges said uh that's kind of creepy and instead they picked the eiffel tower but the people like so the eiffel tower like it had a restaurant it had elevators like they were the very first of their kind like they didn't work very long and they were constantly breaking but it had elevators and and the and as it was being built so here's paris down below all the all these parisians were like god that's so ugly like they hated it they hated it it like marred the skyline of their beautiful city there's a writer named Guy de Maupassant, I'm sure I said that perfectly. And he left Paris because he was sick of the Eiffel Tower, all the commemorative items that had been made for the Eiffel Tower. When he still lived there, he would eat in its restaurant every day so that when he looked out at Paris, he didn't see the Eiffel Tower. Now that's like, that's kind of a little extreme, don't you think? So we have cast iron and wrought iron in Houston. The uh, cast iron is that the, this is that iron that's been poured in the mold right down the street from the school or the post rifle lofts. And um, the light rail runs right along the side of it. And then this is Texas Avenue. And not only is this cast iron, but it also has examples of, if I'm not mistaken, Corinthian columns, there you go. And look, what's this? What's this an example of? I'm not gonna tell you, but that's another thing that's gonna be on the scavenger hunt. So, you know, like we're, we live in Houston. We, anybody who's lived in a big city, you're, you're used to these giant towering skyscrapers but back in the day back in the late 1800s they didn't really have skyscrapers they had kind of pretty low buildings but there was all into the cities in the in the north in the midwest and in california there was like this increased immigration part of this immigration came from the great migration of african americans fleeing the south and hoping for a better life in the in like these northern and midwest cities like chicago and then part of this immigration was there was like increased immigration of italians germans 
um, because of the potato famine, the Irish, like, so like tons and tons of people are coming into these cities where one year the population might be 10,000 and then 10 years later the population is 100,000. So there's no room for people to live. So the solution was reinforce concrete. So they'd take concrete and they would put iron rebar in it and reinforce it. And then that way they were able to make taller buildings out. And they're not taller buildings like we know. The first skyscrapers were only like eight to 10 feet 10 feet, that'd be ridiculous. Eight to 10 stories high. So here, I, I, I quoted the numbers wrong, but this, this gives you an idea of how many people like immigrated into Chicago. So in 1860, the population was 100,000. And then in 20 years later, the population is a million plus. Also, there had been this great fire in Chicago that burnt down all these buildings that that were made out of wood or had wooden roofs or uh, wooden reinforcements. So they they had to build a bunch of new buildings. So the the first skyscraper, and again, when I say skyscraper, I mean eight to 10 stories, was a home insurance building. Oh, look, it's twice the home insurance building, the home insurance really, by Will, um, the architect was William LeBaire and Jenny. So Jenny, what he had done, like, so his, um, he and his wife, they had a big old, like a bird cage. Maybe it wasn't a big old one, it was a bird cage. And his wife, for some crazy reason, stacked a whole bunch of books on top of it. And and Jenny was like, oh wow, look, it didn't even collapse from the weight of all those books. So maybe we can use those in buildings. So when they would build these buildings, the building, there was no air conditioning back then. I can't even imagine living here in Houston with no air conditioning. I think everybody would have died, but there was no air conditioning. So there was a great, need to have tons of windows in these buildings. So there'd be buildings all around and they'd open those windows. And, um, and the technique that Jenny developed to construct these buildings so they could have a lot of windows is skin and skeleton construction. So um, they would make cast iron and then now we use still supports into a frame. You see these construction sites all the time. And this frame is called the skeleton. And then once the skeleton is completed, then they start putting the skin on it, which is masonry like bricks or stone and glass. And the great thing about skin and skeleton construction is again, it requires less materials than previous techniques because you're having to build these six stone walls um, and that takes up a lot of material. But with skin and skeleton, there there's a need for less support and then you can build this frame and then you, you put the skin on the outside, the glass and masonry. So like, I'm gonna go back to this. So this is like, it's a building. This is this is the first skyscraper. It's a building. It's pretty plain. A lot of architects back then were making pretty plain buildings. But then um, Lewis H. Sullivan comes along and he's kind of sick of those plain buildings and he starts making these incredibly beautiful early skyscrapers that have all this filigree and stonework and totally highly ornate designs on them. And, <coughs> pardon me, the sad thing is, because these are amazing looking buildings, in the recent past, these should be like a heritage site, three of these buildings in Chicago were destroyed, one accidentally, I don't know how that works, 
and two of them purposely demolished, which is was pretty awful that this happened. So he, these buildings that these early skyscrapers of Sullivan's, they also use cast iron, but then we, we find out that cast iron is not a safe material to use. It, even though wood burns more quickly, cast iron melts more quickly at low temperatures. And so it's really dangerous. So this is kind of the, the story I'm going to tell you is the turning point of why people had to find a better alternative to cast iron. So in 1911, there's this sky, or at least skyscraper, called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. The owner of, so there weren't any fire escapes, and the owner of the factory, or the manager, or whatever, he was like, people are taking too many breaks. They need to stop taking breaks. So he would, he would lock all the doors so that people couldn't leave the building until it was time to go home. So somebody like draw, I don't know, like I think I remember reading the story that somebody just like put some oily rags in the trash can and then I'm sure somebody probably lit a cigarette or somehow there was a fire could be an electrical fire since there was electricity back then and the wiring was probably faulty. And then the next thing you know, like the building's on fire and people couldn't get out of the building. There end up being 146 deaths uh, because people, people are jumping out of the window and stuff trying to get out of there. The, um, by the way, what is a shirt waist? This was like a style that was popular around the turn of the century, 20th century. And these were these kind of like puffy, like three quarter sleeves and puffy like blouses with high, um, high collars on them that women, women wore. And then those poor women, they would be in a corset made out of whalebone. And then they, like it would be so tight on them it looked like they had like a three inch waist. My mother back in the day had a 19 inch waist. I don't think I ever did. So we have one of those early skyscrapers in Houston. It's the first skyscraper in Houston. It's just down the street from U of H. It's about eight stories tall and it's, um, it was constructed in 1904. But I'm sure they replace. I'm sure they replace the cast iron with steel, or else it wouldn't be there. So we were talking about concrete. The Romans invented concrete. We're going to talk about reinforced concrete. That's concrete reinforced with bars of iron and steel. So, like, so the Romans, they invent concrete. They're using big, heavy rocks in it. But then in the Middle Ages, maybe starting around 600 or something, the people that knew how to build it die. All of them, every single one of them. Either because of famine or war or invasions or pestilence, whatever. So people don't know how to make it anymore. And we go, centuries where people are making buildings out of just like regular masonry and bricks and stuff. But in 1850, people start figuring out how to make concrete. And then in 1870, they start making reinforced concrete where they're putting cast iron uh, rebar into the concrete, making it um, more sturdy. So now we use steel when, when we, like I'm making reinforced concrete, whoever's making it uses steel rebar. And, uh, um, and it's this reinforced concrete lets you make taller buildings. You can pour it into molds and make these more elaborate structures. 
it's really strong and it and it requires less material than the previous technique so the pieces of concrete don't have to be so thick so we'll talk about a really famous house god i wish i could see this too that uses reinforced concrete and then um, we talked about Louis Sullivan and we looked at his highly ornate designs on those early um, skyscrapers. Well, you know, like what happens a lot of times is you'll have a teacher and your teacher works a certain way and you're like, I'm not going to work like that. Um, that happens to me all the time. Students say, I'm not going to do what Ms. Secor says. And they, um, and so they kind of, go a different direction than the instructor went. So um, Sullivan's buildings were incredibly ornate. And then Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings, he wants his buildings to blend into the natural environments where they're built. He believes in the unity of design and nature. So this is one really famous house of his called falling water house and it's sort of like built over a small waterfall in the house he has as part of let me see if this is on the next slide it is he has these um these are called cantilevers they're they project off the side of the house and he didn't want to put like a ton of supports underneath it because he wanted the beauty of these walls to project out. So a cantilever is like a long projecting beam or a girder fixed at one end. So it's only fixed where it attaches to the house. And he knew exactly how much reinforced concrete he wanted in it. But the contractor who's building the house thinks like, that's not enough. Like that thing is going to fall down. So he puts twice as much steel into the cantilever. And then ever since then, because there's too much steel, they've been, they've been sagging. So there's been problems ever since they were built. There is one example of a Frank Lloyd Wright house in Houston. It's Saxton house. Um, somebody bought it finally, but it was only in the, in the like in 2013 it's only two and a half million dollars only i used to tell students to buy it but now you can't because a man lives there um so reinforced con so so when we talked about um frank Lloyd wright his, his aren't his buildings aren't as ornate he wants them to blend into the natural environment and um and there's a whole group of young architects that also like believe in a like less ornate style. So there's one, Le Corbusier. He, um, we talked about minimalism before. You probably forgot already, but minimalists use like very little color, just like geometric shapes, and and the minimalist architects like they they their buildings had less structural supports and lots of windows and their um like lake Corbusia believed the house should be not only should be beautiful but it should function like a machine and it sh should serve those who live in it there's not a robot in there that would make me think it was functioning like a machine so another one of these um, architects that are minimalist are is like Mies van der Rohe, and again, lots of glass. I hope these people have curtains. The houses are nearly transparent. They use really neutral colors, so it's not competing with the nature around them. And this is Farmsworth House, and Mies van der Rohe, he had like a, a, a maxim or a saying where he said, less is more. So he thought the less like external details and the less support and the more windows he used, um, the more beautiful the building 
would be, and he, he believed in bringing nature, houses, and human beings together in a higher unity. So they're just not architects, they're kind of like philosophers. So there is an example of, of Mies van der Rohe's work in Houston, a building with few structural supports and lots and lots of windows. And this is like, if you've ever gone by the Museum of Fine Arts or even at one time, if you went into it, but now we're in coronavirus times. Um, the, the front of the building, the Cullinan Hall and Brown Pavilion, those were those were designed and um and built by not he didn't build them but he designed a Mies van der Rohe. So the, the cool thing about reinforced concrete is it can be cast into molds and that way you can have all these really innovative designs. You're not stuck with this rectilinear cube. So this is a really famous example which sadly to say has been it's been going into ruin. This is by Iro Saarinen, and it's the TWA terminal or at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. He wanted this building, because it's for the airport, he wanted it to look like a bird in flight, which it does. He, um, like in the book, there's some examples of the interior of the building. And it's almost like it has this like, almost like, I don't know how to describe it any other way, but like a swooping feature. Like you can imagine a bird flying around the, the entire building, but it, it was a really beautiful building and I hope they restore it. So again, because of reinforced concrete, you can build a building in any form. This is a uh, Frank Gehry, an architect. He, um, he designed the the Guggenheim Bilbao or the Bilbao Museo in Spain. And look at this, like if a student of mine turned this in, I'd go like, that's a big fat app. But the way he designed the building is he just like scribbled, this is like all the scribbledy do. Here, here's my design. And then they, he took this design and then further improved upon it one would hope and this is what the design of the Bilbao looks like on the outside it's right on the water I hope it doesn't flood so there's like I'm just going to show you some all sorts of houses and these innovative designs um, the thumbprint building it doesn't exist it was like an ad for a company that, that does security but I'd like to think it existed. I'm losing my voice, people. Okay, so hopefully I'm almost done. So nowadays, you know, people are really, you would hope a lot of people are really conscious about protecting the environment. So there, there becomes a, a need for greener, more energy efficient buildings that use less materials, that are more cost effective and and this, in order to get something deemed as one of these buildings, you, you have to get LEED certification. And that it stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it verifies, like these are these independent people that verify that the, the building's green features allowed for, um, that, the, that the building's green, let me say that. And, it, these buildings are like resource efficient, high performing, healthy, cost effective buildings. So many of these buildings will have like plants planted on the roof because those plants like insulate it in the winter, make it cooler in the, in the hot months. And this is like this really beautiful building in Japan. Again, I wish I could see it. Um, that has terraces that are covered in plants and then there's this big green open space park in front of it. This is a, a building in, in Singapore. It's the Nanyang Technolog Technological University, the arts building. Um, there, 
there's like this is a would that be so cool to stay in that hotel this is the california academy of sciences um all all sorts of buildings and in houston you're not going to have to find it because it's kind of far there's building 12 in nasa and it has wildflowers and a garden on top which is pretty cool now a building in houston that is in part planted on the roof with plants is the glass cell school it looks like a big terrace leading to the top that's covered in ferns and the glass cell school is uh, at the corner of montrose and bissonette like right across from the museum of fine arts this is this is not lead certified this is a phoenix tower that's like has astroturf and there's a putt putt golf or a putting green on top what do they do like do they putt and then the balls go off the roof and then hit somebody in a car below i don't get it so global warming has also started affecting design this is a hotel in key largo florida i'm sure it costs a pretty penny to stay there and then there's these um this vincent calibo has designed these like these floating ecopolis for climate refugees and i show a picture of the book and like a bunch of people could live there like if it's the end of the world and the and there's no more land i suppose but these are you'd have to be really rich so all of us are well i don't want to assume how rich you are but i know that i'm not going to be able to afford to live there and so i'm just going to drown and that's how that's how i'm ending in the lecture i'm going to drown at the end of the world okay so that is our last lecture and uh, and your final project is is a architecture and art scavenger hunt and please read those directions for that really carefully all right talk to you soon bye-bye